Hi, welcome to ECNM Tech Talks. This is a series of how-to videos where we cover everything from basic theory, not a little bit anyway, huh? Onto the uh, equipment that we use out in the field and maybe some of the techniques for installation and maintenance and so forth. We also get into the codes and standards that apply to our installation and maintenance practices out in the field. I'm Randy Barnett. I'm your host today. Uh, we'll be talking about generators. This is brought to you by ECNM Magazine. Now, if you're watching this on YouTube or something and you haven't already, you need to go to ecmweb.com. So go to ecmweb.com and in that upper left-hand menu, uh, there's a drop-down, you know, click on the menu and it's a drop-down menu and you'll find premium content. And uh, that's what you want to click on. Click on premium content. And if you haven't already, sign up for it. It's free. You'll get tons of information related to the topic that we're talking about, uh, certainly when it comes to generators today. So anyway, let's get started and talk about generators then. Now, when it comes to uh, generators, you know, we think, well, let's see, that's, that's Article uh, 445 in the National Electrical Code. And so we're going to be working out of the NEC today, most current edition being the 2023. There have been some changes, so we're going to talk about that. So we're going to talk about the installation of generators. Now, Article 445, that's equipment for general use, isn't it? Chapter 4. And uh, so as I say, you know, those first four chapters, that's the stuff we know every day. We get out of bed in the morning and we already know everything in one through four. Well, you know, it's our normal, uh, our typical installation practices, I guess you could say. So we install a lot of generators. However, if you install a generator, Article 445, say, well, I'm done, you know, and of course, using those, those first four chapters for all your other installation techniques and requirements and so on, uh, you're not done with 445. You need to look at the application of that generator. You need to figure out what is it being used for. So that's what we're going to do. Rather than just me talk and explain to you the requirements of 445 and, and some supplemental information back in Chapter 7, uh, also I'm going to mention another book uh, the, and a standard that we have to talk about. If we're going to talk about generators, we need to talk about the NFPA 110 standard, which is the standard for emergency and standby power systems. So anyway, let's build ourselves an infographic, see if we can't make it a little more interesting anyway than just talk, huh? So let's take a look at this. So as I said, we first uh, we find our real first information on generators in, in the NEC in Article 445, and it's for the general requirements for installation of generators. But I said we need to know more about that. We need to know about the applications as well. If you remember, well, it's way back in, in uh, Article 90, but it talks about uh, uh, that chapters one through seven uh, can also, you know, five, six, and seven, chapters five, six, and seven will also supplement the information that's in those first seven chapters. So we have a good example in that in Article 445, and we're going to go through the installation requirements, but we also have an article uh, in Chapter 7, Article 700, which is for emergency systems. So now I'm installing my generator, and if this generator system does not start and do what it's supposed to, wasn't installed properly, wasn't maintained properly, uh, we could have a loss of life or certainly damage to someone's health and so on. You know, I think uh, uh, probably, you know, biggest case scenarios, I guess, something like uh, a hospital, a high rise building where we need to get people out of uh, uh, air traffic control center, right? Things like that. Those are emergency generator systems or emergency standby systems we're going to talk about. Also, we have something else called Article 701, and uh, it's for legally required standby systems. And actually, the, the terminology they talk about, they say, well, they're less critical. They're not uh, as important as critical to human life and health. Well, I don't know. That's kind of kind of weird terms. In fact, the code book even uses the term rescue operations. And so I always think of it this way. In Article 700, if the power goes off, and we don't get some emergency power back within 10 seconds, then we have a danger of losing someone's life, or uh, we could certainly you know, damage health due to uh, bad vapors or fumes in the air, improper ventilation, smoke, and things like that. Once the fire department shows up, I look at it this way. We're into Article 701, rescue operations, right? A fireman needs to be able to get into that elevator and 
put that key in there and turn it, make the elevator operate. You may need certain ventilation systems operating, communication systems, and so on. And so when we talk about 700 and 701, we're very closely tied together. Now, the requirements for Article 701 is that the, the uh, standby power, emergency power source, legally required standby system then, must be able to start, come up online, and be supplying power within 60 seconds. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. The emergency system, 10 seconds. So we can be talking some pretty big generators here. Think about this. I've got a 3,000 horsepower diesel engine driving a big two, two and a half kW, whatever it is, uh, or excuse me, two, two and a half megawatt uh, generator, right? And um, I'm going to ask that diesel engine, say 3,000 horsepower or so, 16 cylinders maybe, 642 cubic inches for each cylinder. I'm going to ask that big, huge engine to start come up to speed, full power, deliver electricity, and no more than 10 seconds from parade rest. Right? Now you think about that. Cold weather, that, that's not going to work too well if that diesel fuel has gelled on the inside and so forth. So all of a sudden, we're going to find ourselves getting into more requirements than just the uh, Article 700 and 701. And Article 701, legally required system, I have to deliver power within 60 seconds then. Also, we have another article, Article 702. So we're still, we're all in the NEC, right? Article 702 is for optional standby systems. The way I look at that, that uh, the optional standby generator is, is that, um, hey, if it starts great, if it doesn't, oh well, okay? Uh, not quite that, right? If I'm in a hotel and they lose power and the generator doesn't start, check out, go to another hotel, right? In a manufacturing plant, maybe I have some processes going on though. There's no danger to life and, and people and so forth, but uh, hey, I, I, you know, we've gotten everybody safely out of the building, so no problems there in an emergency. However, I would like to save some product, do a normal shutdown on my equipment, those type things. So those are optional standby systems. And you can imagine if you were to go through and uh, you install, uh, as you apply, look at the applications of these generators, the Article 700 generator is going to have a lot more requirements than the Article, a little bit more than the 701, and certainly both of those will have a lot more than an Article 702 optional standby system. So let's start with, first thing, let's take a look at the main topics out of Article 445. Pretty much everything that's in there as far as installation requirements in the NEC then. First of all, everything's got to be listed, right? So dot six tells me it's got to be listed. And um, no surprises there. And this is for stationary generators. All stationary generators have to be listed. Dot 11 talks about marking requirements. Yeah, I've got to have marking requirements. In fact, I've got to have a nameplate on that generator. And the change is that that nameplate has to be accessible. And if you've ever spent any time looking for a nameplate on the generator, I'm not talking about the engine. I'm talking about the generator portion. You may have found yourself in some precarious positions on your back with an inspection meter or now a, a cell phone or whatever, trying to get a picture of a nameplate, huh? So uh, uh, the nameplate has to be accessible. And of course, it tells us there's certain information on there. Now, uh, for you engineers, there's also information required to be available to you for things like uh, the subtransient reactants and all of that stuff that you need to figure out the available fault current out of the generator and do your arc flash analysis and all that type of information. Over current protection is required. No surprise there on our generator. And it actually gets some options. It talks about inherent protection. And you go, what's that? That's not a fuse or a circuit breaker. No. Uh, if we look at our constant voltage generators, and you know, if you've ever, if you run on the grid, you run whatever load you need, right? And if, if you overload a uh, switch gear breaker somewhere, it trips. But if you're loading down an individual generator, you can hear it slow down, can't you? Blah, 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 big diesel engine or something like that as you load it down. And what will happen is the voltage will start to drop off as well. The unit will trip off the line and protect itself. But we also talk about in section 445.12 about other types of overcurrent protection, of course. Conductor ampacity is section.13 in 445. And there your requirement is you look at the nameplate 
and you take 115% of that rated current that's on that nameplate, and that is how you're going to have to size your conductors in, of course, based on conditions of use as well and so forth. Right? Now, sections 14, 15, and 16 are pretty straightforward, right? I have to protect live parts, you know, 50 volts and greater and things like that. I don't want anybody to get shocked and inadvertently touch something. I need guards for the attendance so nobody sticks their, their hand in there and touches a rotating part or something terrible like that. Bushings are required. Any wiring that I do to that generator, I have to install a bushing in that conduit or that opening wherever I am. Because uh, uh, you think about it, that generator, as it runs, it vibrates by its very nature. And so eh, a little bit of a sharp edge somewhere. And I've got that insulation vibrating over the years, thousands of hours of operation uh, vibrating that on that sharp point. And I could end up, of course, with a ground falter or serious trouble. So. We always use the bushings on the generators when we do our wiring. Disconnecting means I've got to have a disconnect on my generator, right? So I have to have a way to disconnect those, those uh, uh, conductors somewhere between where I tap off of the generator and where I head out to the load somewhere. And might be a, uh, a disconnect switch. It could be a breaker. That disconnect can be located internal to the uh, 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 generator component. Um, I should say generator compartment, but internal to the uh, structure where the generator is housed. So I would have to open a door, go into the room and operate the disconnect that's permitted. So those are the uh, really the basic requirements or pretty much the requirements as we look through here for Article 445 on generators. Uh, it's only a couple of pages long, uh, but uh, some good information. One other thing I'll mention too is dot 20 is the um, portable generators, right? And so now we're talking about 15 kW and less and ground fault circuit interruption protection required for receptacles on 15 kW and smaller. And we see that in the field. We purchase those generators. They come with GFCI protected receptacles on them, don't they? Okay. One of the new requirements is the uh, emergency shutdown. And this is section 445.19. I do want to mention that. Emergency shutdown of the prime mover. And so if, if you've ever done any work, uh, uh, been around diesel generators a lot, you know that that generator, you can hit the, you can turn it off, hit the stop button or whatever, and uh, that generator continues to run. Uh, what's happening is you're getting an effect called dieseling, where the basically it's like creosote that's up in the stack drains back down onto the top of the cylinders and the engine continues to run. You want to shut the generator off right now, whatever's going on. So you need an emergency shutdown. And when you hit that emergency shutdown button, you may do something like, depending on the type of engine, you may uh, trip the fuel racks, right? That are supplying the fuel to the engine, the injectors. And uh, uh, so no fuel at all gets in. Uh, you know, one of the best ways is to take the uh, incoming, is to shut off the incoming air, all right? And that will shut that engine down right now. You won't have any combustion. So anyway, you do need an emergency shutdown for the prime mover. Now, we talked about Article 700 and 701 a little bit. I want to mention this NFPA 110 standard as well a little bit. So your authority having jurisdiction, your AHJ, you install the generator for 445, right? The AHJ comes in and says, you now have an Article uh, 700 emergency generator. So all of a sudden, your rules and regulations start to change for the installation, maintenance, and operation of that equipment. Now, some of the requirements between Article 700 and 701 are the same. So let's talk about these right down here. First of all, testing and maintenance is required. OK. That's great. I think it's three sentences in the National Electrical Code, both in Article 700 and in 701. What testing do I do? It says, well, the AHJ has to conduct a witness test uh, during the commissioning of those generators. All right. What about maintenance? It says perform maintenance. Well, what do you want me to do? If you know, uh, if, you, if you work around diesel generators a lot, diesel engines and so forth, you know that fuel is critical, maintaining the fuel, for example. Also, think about if I said you've got 10 or 60 seconds to get this unit up to speed and on the line producing power, uh, you don't want it sitting outdoors. You may want it indoors 
uh, you may want it heated. You may want the lube oil, the radiator coolant to pump around and, and keep that engine nice and warm. So you'll have some heaters associated with that engine and, and so forth. And all of that has to be maintained. And what about the battery system? If I go to start the generator and the batteries are dead, that's not good. So testing and maintenance becomes a big issue. And that's where I find my requirements in Article 110. For instance, uh, NFPA, or excuse me, the NEC 700 and 701 talk about doing periodic testing and periodic testing under load to make sure that it can carry the emergency lighting and power loads that it needs to. And it doesn't tell you how often or how to conduct that test. The NFPA 110 standard does then. So this is a vital document if you're going to operate and maintain these generators after they're installed. Also, something else I'll mention is that the, uh, uh, the authority having jurisdiction, uh, he may say, well, you're an Article 700 generator, okay? And he may further classify your system. So he's already classified it as a level one for you, meaning that it's critical to human life and safety and health of workers and so forth and people, um, as opposed to a level two, which just says it's less critical. But we talked about Article 701. However, he may also further classify that system. He may tell you that you have a, a level one uh, class six type U generator. That just changed a lot for you during that, that uh, installation and maintenance processes. So the class, the level designation tells me its relationship to safety and health. The class designation tells me how much fuel I have to have available. How long can I run that that generator without having to refuel it. The National Electrical Code says two hours in Article 700 and 701. If he tells you it's a, a class six, you now gotta have six hours of fuel on board. That changes a few things, doesn't it? And what if he tells you that it is a, uh, a type U? Type U means that it's interruptible power. The 10 seconds no longer applies. Yeah, the generator is gonna start and come up on the line realistically, probably four to six seconds but I can't go without power. I can't go without any power at all in that emergency room or that operating room or that NICU facility or whatever in that hospital. I need power all the time. So if I'm gonna have an uninterruptible source of power, I've gotta have a battery backup system so nice of time. I'm gonna have an automatic transfer system. That's all covered in article 700, 701 as well. That becomes a huge installation then, doesn't it? It's no longer just installing a generator. So let's take a look at some of the additional requirements in Article 700 and 701 then. Uh, part two is on wiring in both of these articles. The big difference is in the Article 700 emergency systems, all of my wiring for my emergency lighting and power is separate from the normal wiring and powering and uh, wiring for lighting and power in my building. In 701, legally required standby system, I can have those uh, conductors inside the same raceways and so forth. So that makes a difference. Power sources are discussed, but really for more information on power sources and what types of fuel you should use and so forth, once again, take a look at the NFPA 110 standard. Now, um, in Article 700, we get into Part 5, which is on emergency lighting and control circuits and so forth, and overcurrent protection on some of the downstream circuits and so forth. We see a little bit less requirements over in Article 701, then it only has uh, four parts rather than the six parts in Article 700. As far as uh, Article 702, the optional standby systems in uh, very limited supplemental requirements for those particular systems. So, wow, that was a lot of stuff in, in a short period of time. A huh? lot of information in the National Electrical Code and the NFPA 110 standard then on generators. But we're out of time for today. It's uh, a topic we could talk for days on. Get involved in it. If you're involved in stalling, operating, or maintaining emergency or legally required or optional standby systems, generators, get involved in the National Electrical Code and 110. So uh, that concludes it for today. Remember, this is brought to you by ecnmweb.com and it's part of the portfolio of the Endeavor Business Publications. Thanks, and the main thing is work safe.